Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 820, with today's guest, Kira Radke. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host for the show, founder of Whistlekick, where everything we do is in support of the traditional martial arts. In fact, our very reason for existing is to connect, educate, and entertain the traditional martial artists of the world en route to getting everybody in the world to train in some form of traditional martial art for at least six months. Why? Because we believe martial arts brings out a better version of ourselves and we want to make the world a better place. If you want to see all the things that we're doing to that end, go to whistlekick.com. And one of the things you'll find there is a store because we make and sell stuff. It's one of the ways that we fund what we do. But if you use the code podcast15, you save 15% and it lets us know that people who pay attention to this show also want to support us in that way. Now you can go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com to get more on this or any of the episodes we've ever done. We continue to leave them all out there for you. No paywalls, nothing like that if you want to go back further like some podcasts do. 820 episodes with transcripts and links and social media and all kinds of good stuff to give you more context and help you connect, educate, and entertain. Other ways that you might consider helping us in our mission, you can join our Patreon. You could tell a friend about us. You could check out the family page at whistlekick.com slash family. You could hire Whistlekick to support your school as a consultant. You want to grow? Lots of things you can do there. And there's one other thing that you can do. You can consider supporting our sponsors. Today, we have Kataro as a sponsor. K-A-T-A-A-R-O dot com. Kataro. You probably know Kataro, if you know them. Most of you know them from their awesome belts. These guys make the absolute best belts available. We tried to make belts. It did not work. We will not make belts again. This is part of why we're partnering with Kataro because they do something absolutely amazing. And that's what Whistlekick tries to do is make amazing things and partner with amazing people and amazing companies. Now, if you're watching this in video, you can see there's a Whistlekick logo on this belt. I'll tell you when I took this thing out of the box, absolutely thrilled. They have a ton of options from the fabric to the width, the length. You're not just picking a size and a color. You're picking everything on this belt, if you so choose. And if you use the code WK10 at their website, kataro.com, capital W, capital K, number one, number zero, you can save 10% on your first order. You probably have a number of uniforms that you wear, a bunch of different clothes that you might wear underneath, maybe even different colors of sparring gear but you probably only have one belt that you wear. Why not make it a great belt that you're going to be excited to wear that reflects the time and the effort that went into earning it? Check them out. Kataro, we're happy to have them as a partner. Now, today's episode with Kira Radke is a wonderful conversation about someone who, I think the best way to describe it is her path could have easily gone a very different way. But as you look back on it, I think you'd be surprised if it had gone a different way. And that, that probably sounds vague, and it probably sounds like I'm not telling you anything. But I bet once you check out this episode, once you watch or listen, you're going to see exactly what I'm talking about. There are a lot of possibilities in front of Kira, but only one that I think, once you get to know her, really would have made sense. So here's my episode with Kira Radke. Hello. Good morning, Jeremy. How are you? So what's going on? How are ah, you? Just excited to be here. Yeah, I'm glad we finally get to talk. I get to know you better. Yeah. <laughs> Getting all get all set up for uh, Bill Wallace this weekend. We're pretty yeah. we're pretty stoked. Yeah. How how is it how is it looking? People seem excited. Yes. Good. Yes, where we're meeting our like pre-registration goals. And... Good. You've done some good promotion on that. A lot of people I, I've seen, I've had some friends that have hosted him and they just, I feel like they, they, they take like a post-it to a, to a telephone pole and they're like, that's good. That's yeah. Good. No, <laughs> no you, promotion. You gotta, you gotta try. I learned long ago, I have to put it everywhere. If I want it to stick and I want to get the turnout that I want, I have to be obnoxious and obscene. So yeah. One of the things I talk about exactly. with, with my clients, whether they're martial arts schools or not, the marketing theory right now is estimating it takes about 50 impressions for a yeah. message to stick. I wouldn't doubt it. 
I wouldn't doubt it. I know how many times I swipe past a flyer or something, you know, and and it because takes quite a few times before because I we get so many messages where the average person is getting about 10,000 a day. Yeah. I don't doubt it. It's incredible. <laughs> now, I know a little bit about you because you popped up as a nominee for the first Never Settle Awards last year. And I was like, That's you know, looking through the names and I'm going, I know most of these people. And the ones that I don't, I know why, I I, I know how they got here. I know I know who nominated, I, I could connect the dots for almost everybody but you. <laughs> and I went, who is this person? And where does she come from? And why don't I know her? And, and et cetera, et cetera. And so that's how I started to, to know a bit about you. But you've been, I mean, you, you, you didn't just open a school like yesterday. You've been training for a while. You've been doing your thing for a while. So let's talk about how all that started. When, when did you start training? Let's, do, let's go there. Oh, absolutely. I, did the, I knew you were going to ask me that question. So I did the math. And uh, this summer, it's going to be my 30th year. Cool. So I started training in 1993. Cool. Awesome. Right? Yeah. 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 Uh, that works. I'm, I'm also <laughs> celebrating as uh, a training zero this year. Yeah. Congrats. Which zero? Uh, the next one. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Which is weird because I'm 25. I'm not really sure how that math adds up. That's what I'm saying. I know. It just doesn't compute. I don't know how that's possible. How did you get into it? Is this a family thing, friend thing? No, completely random. Um, mm -hmm. I signed up for a park district martial arts program mm -hmm. um, when I was 12 years old. I am pretty sure my dad signed me up. He wanted to toughen me up, you know, make sure that I could uh, defend myself if I ever needed to and signed up with a girlfriend of mine. We were in sixth grade and she lasted for one session and I'm still going strong. <laughs> Now, we've had a lot of people on the show, just because of the, the numbers, who actually started at that adolescent age. And, and you know, yeah. as an instructor, that is not common. It is I mean, not it, common right now. I feel like it was more so back, back when I started. It was more common yeah. to start at that age. I remember one of my programs, I wasn't allowed to begin until I was like 14. You know, it wasn't made for younger children. Sure. Um, it was more of an older, you, were, you had to be older to do it. And um, as I spend most of my days now with four-year-olds, I, I <laughs> question my sanity. And I also think of how incredible it is that they have such a start, you know, if they're doing something similar and similar in my shoes, what a, what a great head start that they get. Absolutely. So even though friend didn't stick with it, you, you kept going. What was it you found in that class that maybe she didn't find? You know, I don't know. It's that fickle teenage years, yeah. you know, it just really seemed like a good fit for me. Don't know why it really didn't work out for her. And I suppose I didn't ask those kind of questions back in the day, but it was just, it was a really good, good fit for me. I was not a sport player. Mm -hmm. um, every activity that involved a ball usually ended up in my face. Uh, and <laughs> I feel like there are stories there. We don't have to go there, but it sounds like there are some stories. <laughs> I uh, I never felt like any of the traditional uh, sports that all the other kids that I knew were doing uh, fit for me. And this really did. And uh, it was something athletic that I, I did pretty good in. I didn't get hurt as much. And <laughs> yeah, it was just, it was a really, really good fit mm -hmm. for me. When did it go from, this is a thing I'm trying out to, this is a thing I'm really enjoying? That's a good question. My teacher put me to work pretty early. Mm -hmm. So I was about maybe 15 or 16 when I was helping with a lot of classes, like we always get recruited to do, mm -hmm. uh, especially once we hit black belt. And it just, it, the teaching really stuck with me. So mm -hmm. um, that, that's when I knew it just, it really had hold of me. I really had an impact on people's lives. And uh, I just, at the time, I just knew that that, that felt good mm -hmm. to, to do good things. Now, starting at the age you did, I'm sure you had ideas of what you might want to do with your life. Did they line up with teaching at all? Yes. Okay. Um, in fact, uh, I was on the impression that martial arts really would just always be a hobby for me. Mm -hmm. So when I went to college, I went to school to be a teacher. Fast forward, I um, 
I taught 11 years of eighth grade math around here locally mm -hmm. and continued to do the martial arts kind of part-time after, after I got done teaching, I would zoom back out to my school and teach in the evenings and on the weekends. Okay. So you had your own martial arts school at that point, but it was no. the, oh, okay. The no, school I you were attending. Okay. Yeah. I didn't own my own school till about six years ago. Okay. All right. So let's, so let's go back. So college learning to be a teacher, graduate, math teacher. I know, I know a number of math teachers or martial artists. I'm thinking math, science, math. Actually, yeah, and I, I did it skews cool. more, more math and science than it does humanities. That's something I'm going to have to process. Oh, yeah. um, and you're probably, sounds like you started teaching and never stopped teaching martial arts. It was a, a thread that was continuous. Correct. Yeah, they just couldn't get rid of me. Why, why go into being a school teacher? Why not just teach martial arts full time at, yeah, at that point, never, at that college point? It was never an option for me. To me, yeah. you know, and, and the groups that I was associated with, it was just, this is always a hobby, you know, get mm -hmm. yourself a real career, a real career, you know, with benefits and re, uh, dependability. And, uh, you know, as a school teacher, you have tenure. So, mm -hmm. you know, you're going to be able to have that job and keep that job. And it was, it was never an option for me, like, uh, till, till, maybe just recently I was the first one in my family to go to college. Mm -hmm. So I did that and they, everybody, you know, was like, you need to get a job. That comes a real with expectations. Job, college career. Yeah. There's that, that path that they wanted that they saw for you. Yeah. And yeah, we're, we're almost the same age. So I understand that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And so you said six years. So what's that? In 20, 4, 12, there a gap in there. <laughs> however, why, why after, after putting all those years in as a school teacher, did you set that down? Yeah, you, it was done all the hard part, right? The, the hard part, right? Like <laughs> math doesn't change. You don't have to rework your curriculum that much. Maybe, maybe you did once, you know, for common core, but uh, it's not like there's new... <laughs> Yes, you're not alone. Uh, maybe that is that what did it? You went, okay, I'm out. I can't do this anymore. This is ridiculous. Or or was it something else? Was there something about, was it more of a draw of martial arts than a push from school teaching? It was it was a combination of two things. And that's, that's when I knew I had to do it. Um, teaching changed quite a bit in like the 10 years that I taught quite a bit. It was um, increasingly difficult to make a difference, you know, to, to really, um, to really do good. And that, that's kind of the core of why I love being a teacher is that I, you know, I can pass on knowledge and make a difference and develop relationships and, you know, I don't know, change the world somehow. Um, so it changed a lot. It was becoming harder and harder to kind of make that influence that I wanted to. And then I also switched martial arts schools and I started teaching uh, for another friend of mine, mm -hmm. and he's the one that kind of opened the door and, you know, gave me a lot of opportunities that I hadn't had before. And I really started looking at it and I was like, no, I, I think, I think I did the math. I'm a numbers cruncher. I did the math. I'm like, Talker. I really think I could do this. I really think I could do this, mm -hmm. you know, and make a living. How long from that notion to implementation? How long did it take? I hemmed and hawed as a school teacher for two years. I think that was like okay. 2011 to 2013. Took myself a leave of absence um, from from teaching, mm -hmm. kind of because I could put it on the back burner and go back if I really needed to. Right. <laughs> and then um, I taught at his school for quite a while and hustled a lot of part time gigs and a lot of part time jobs. That must have been three or four or five years. And then um, 2017, I came here to this school and bought into this school. Mm. Um, took me took me about a year to get to full time. I was still hustling hard with a lot of the part time stuff. What what kind of part time stuff? <laughs> well, I tutored a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I worked at a sushi restaurant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm asking another... because I knew what kind of jobs these likely were, right? Because we know when we know when. Wait, it, it's the time has to line up, right? Because you're probably teaching in the evening. So it can't be that stuff. Um, so 
I, I, I ask because I want the other people in the audience who are considering this to see that you do what you got to do to get retried. Yeah, to it was right? really, so, really, really hard. I sushi tutoring. I substitute taught. I tutored. I worked at a sushi restaurant. I taught at another dojo, a friend of mine. I DJ part time. So I DJ weddings and like events. <laughs> and I roll up in my, uh, in my, Toyota Scion with all my DJ equipment, you know, and I bust out school dances and weddings and stuff. <laughs> that nice. was, that was a real savior for me. I learned how to do that when I was teaching school. It was part nice. of a part of like our student council. I taught the kids how to use the DJ equipment. Awesome. So I did that on the weekends. <laughs> I, 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 I DJ for, for about like a decade. Of, do you? I, I so did. I, I don't for anymore. Like three, three or four hours in the morning, I would teach at the studio at the dojo yeah. and then I'd quick change um put all the gear in my car and then zoom out to a wedding you know like four o'clock till midnight or whatever <laughs> and there are let's see I, I know at least one other school owner dj and it's it's managing a crowd right yeah you're managing a crowd of dancers you're managing a crowd yeah. of children of adults right what, whatever it is it's can you read their energy can you see what they need can you give them that input that they need that gets them going where you want them to go i always said if i could get a bunch of awkward middle school kids uh to dance at a school dance a wedding's easy oh, wedding's absolutely <laughs> they want to be there exactly <laughs> okay yeah so there was there was a lot of hustle and struggle yeah was was there a point where you thought it wasn't coming in the time that you wanted it to that you thought about bailing no never never why <laughs> I don't know. I'm stubborn. Okay. Right, but yeah, something tells me far. it's more than that. Uh, yeah. I, I came too far. I gave too much up. I sacrificed okay. too much. Uh, side note, I don't have any responsibilities except for me. So I don't have any kids or whatnot. That would, mm -hmm. if I, if I had a family, this would be a different story, but it's just me. I had to, I had to know that, um, that I had at least tried it, that I had mm -hmm. at least made it happen. And then after that, it's like, no, now we're definitely making it happen. <laughs> Um, let's take a moment if I can, and I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to ask numbers because that's very private, but you bought into a school. That's, that's an uncommon way for someone to become an instructor, right? Typically it would be like, okay, I'm going to open my own school over here under you. And yet the way you did it, you, you get to kind of leverage the existing organization and the support. And, uh, I'm going to guess that as you did, so you probably added programs or added classes unless somebody, the only other way is somebody was retiring, you know, and you were, they were stepping out as you were stepping in. Uh, talk about that decision process, if you would. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it was definitely the right choice for me. Um, kind of fell in my lap. It was, mm -hmm. you know, just, I knew this school, funny enough, I sat on a black belt testing board when I was 16 here at this location. Oh, fun. However many, however many years ago, we're not counting. Um, but yeah, so I was familiar with this, with the, the school. It, it's in the area where I lived and grew up. And um, yeah, it was the right decision for me. I, I would have had a really hard time starting from square, uh, from square one, starting mm -hmm. at $0. It, it would have been nearly impossible for me to make that happen. I left teaching. Um, I didn't have a nest egg. I didn't have anything to kind of, I didn't have any starter funds. Mm -hmm. So this was perfect for me. It's a little unorthodox. I know most people don't do it, but um, I was, I was at least, it was least able to start with a student base. So mm -hmm. I walked in, the facility was already here. I didn't have to wait for a build out. I didn't have to recruit students. They were already here. So it was a man, it was a matter of managing what already existed and kind of making it, making it my own. Mm -hmm. um, but, but there was always, it, the ball was already rolling. Right. Right. Now, that can be a difficult situation because obviously we know it's working out. I mean, I don't know how well it's working out, but, you know, for all I know, it's, you know, we'll stop this recording and things will be thrown and angry people will exist, but that's not my gut feeling based on the little bit that I know of you, but you stepped into an existing culture mm -hmm. and you went to, okay, now I'm going to be part of the one managing this culture when the people who are already managing this culture existed and did not depart. Was that difficult? There was bumps. I wouldn't mm -hmm. call it extremely difficult. I knew, you know, I did a good, 
analysis of kind of um, what kind of school it was, mm. what kind of rep it had, what the culture kind of already felt like. And it was, it was already a good fit. I just had to take what was already there, which was good. School's been here for 30 years. Mm. So it's been here. Like I said, I sat on a testing board here when I was 16, good reputation, good community, um, good community involvement. Mm -hmm. It just, it was a really, really good fit for me. So I knew, you know, for all the things that could go wrong, I, I felt like it was a pretty good bet. Right on. I ruffled right. a couple feathers, but for the most part, <laughs> you know, there is, there is minimal bumps in the road. You can't have growth without change. I know. <laughs> and I can't uh, make everyone happy as much mm, as I try. Mm. Unless they're, unless they're four and they want chicken nuggets. It's... Oh, then I definitely can't make yeah. them happy. No? <laughs> when, how do I want to ask this question? When did it feel comfortable after, after that transition in to ownership? I was comfortable once I made myself full time. Okay. And how long did that part take? About a year. Okay. I want to say it was about a year. Yeah. So still the part-time jobs in that, in that. Interview. Even, <laughs> even after I made myself full-time here, I still have some part-time stuff. Okay. Even now I still have some part-time stuff, you know. It's hard to let those things go, especially if they're lucrative. Weddings pay off. For, for those in the audience that don't understand, um, my business model when I DJed was bring me a quote from one of the other like four places in Vermont. And I'll do it for half price. And it was still very lucrative for me. Yeah, I think after COVID hit, you know, and and, and, you, and you see your, I don't know, you see everything so easily crushed. It's mm -hmm. hard for me not to uh, do, you know, whenever I can put, whenever I can do a little extra, put a little extra away now, um, I'm very, very cognizant of that. I was, I was living very, I was living by the skin of my teeth before COVID and then that hit and that was crushing. So I, I keep doing it. I try to do it less and less. I want to focus, focus on this. This can just be my all day, every day, but it is, it's hard to give up a couple, couple yeah. gigs here and there. <laughs> so, so talk about your day. You said you spend most of your day with four-year-olds. What is my your day teaching is schedule all... and demographics? <laughs> my day's like? all here at the dojo. I get here pretty early, yeah. um, work throughout the day. And then teach, teach most of the evening. So it's mm -hmm. typically like a ten-hour day here. I haven't figured out this whole delegation thing quite yet, but I'm trying. And uh, yeah, just living, eating, breathing martial arts. It's a it's a dream come true. Does it ever get tiring? No, I get Never. tired, but it's not tiring. No. What do you? No, I get tired. <laughs> What do you chalk that up to? I just love it. I love what I do. Why? It's my passion. I get to do martial arts, which I love. I feel like it's one thing that I'm good at. Mm -hmm. um, I get to teach students. I get to change lives. I mean, every day I have the capacity to change lives, you know, make make people better. And that's that's awesome to me. That's That's the whole... That's my whole dream as a teacher. And I get to do both all day long and I get to do it all by my own rules. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't have a principal to tell me what to do. I don't have anyone telling me what curriculum I need to teach. You know, I just need to make my students and my families happy. And uh, yeah, the rewards, the rewards are, are immeasurable. Mm -hmm. You've, you've used the phrase changing lives in a couple of different ways, a few different times. Did somebody change your life? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. All, all my martial arts instructors, you know, especially um, that last studio that I was in when I just, it, it clicked, you know, like, here, this is something you're good at. This is something you can do. You know, why would you let anyone tell you um, this, this couldn't be a career for you? Why would you let anyone tell you that that wouldn't work? You know, and boom, game changer, mindset change and, and go with it. I would love, I would love to see one of my students you know, do something similar, maybe not the exact same thing, but, you know, take martial arts as a passion and, and use it to help others and just pass that along. Hmm. Yeah, you talked about first wanting your family to go to college, kind of that, that laid out 
process oriented dream that again folks of our age there's a lot of expectation that this is what's going to happen i didn't do it either spoiler alert was that difficult for your family to swallow when you said all right i'm giving up teaching i'm going to go teach martial arts and serve uh -huh. sushi and dj <laughs> yeah it was not real well received um not because you know they didn't want me to follow my passion but just uh it's a big financial risk and it really really was you know there's a good chance it doesn't pan out how are you going to afford to live so yeah i think it was a hard pill to swallow i don't think it was necessarily the college thing you know i although there were definitely conversations of we you know you spent a lot of money on college kira <laughs> Are you sure? Are you sure you want to give it up? You know, and I feel like I'm using my teaching still. You know, I have, I have a huge advantage, but I have a master's degree in education. That's it. Mm. Gives me a huge advantage here at the studio. So those those skills carry over. But yeah, it was <laughs> I remember my mom being like, Are you sure? You know, my mom will never tell me it's a stupid idea, but she's <laughs> like, What are you sure? Are you sure you're sure? <laughs> Which is her code, right? <laughs> Her code for yeah. mm, maybe not. I know what that means, but uh, my mom is my biggest fan now. She's here. We do like bring your mom to class day. We do open houses. We do events, and uh, Mama Master Kira is is always here. And uh, I think we've convinced her that it was a good idea. <laughs> nice, nice. Where does that education you mentioned it? It gives you a leg up. In what way? Gosh, every way. Um, so many people are great martial artists, um, but can't necessarily get that into someone else's body or someone else's mind, right? So um, just just all the things that I learned in teaching, um, learning styles, making lesson plans, mm -hmm. you know, creating curriculum, making a curriculum for me is is no problem. You know, I can- You don't, you don't wing it? No, God, no, we don't wing it. We do lesson plans. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> but yeah, just, you know, helping my instructors put, you know, put lessons on rotations and mm -hmm. um, how to better reach their students, how to deal with disciplinary issues and mm -hmm. classroom management, all the things that come with being a teacher that have nothing to do with martial arts. Uh, I, you know, I got all that in my back pocket and I can put that into my studio, into my classes, into my instructor's classes. Now you said your instructors, so you have people who report to you. What's it like teaching the teachers who are teaching? Not everyone gets the chance to do that. Yeah, no, it's awesome. It's awesome. Our studio is super big. We have mm -hmm. to have multiple instructors. It's never, never in this Simultaneously. Facility. You're talking about yeah. in one class. Yeah. What's, yeah. what's the ratio yeah. where, okay, where's the ratio where you have a second person? Um, each of our classes are like 14 to one. Okay. So I'll have a class that'll have 14, about 14 students. You know, there's a classroom over there. They have 14 and there's a classroom in the oh, back. They're, they they're physically broken up into yeah. separate, yeah. separate spaces. Okay. Yeah. So I have to, it's cool. It's cool teaching the other teachers. Um, when I came here, there was already built-in instructors. So that was, that was cool. And they were all really great, like really mm -hmm. awesome instructors. So it was just a matter of uh, maybe throwing out some tips here and there. Mm -hmm. So very, very lucky there. Uh, we recently hired a new instructor. It's been fun kind of helping her get the rope. She didn't come from this, from this school or this curriculum. So catching her up is cool, but yeah, it's, it's neat to, to teach other teachers. Mm -hmm. What for, for people out there who, you know, let's face it, the majority of martial arts schools have the owner slash head instructor who teaches the majority of classes. And you might have somebody who says, hey, can you go take the blue belt and go work that form? Or, you know, I'm going to go do this, you do that. And there isn't a lot of, I don't want to say structure, but formalized structure in those things. Um any advice for those schools that even if they don't have a master's in education or, and don't want to go get one, some tips that you might share with them? Yeah, to me, it's, it's, I want to say super important. It's imperative to uh, make sure that you have someone uh, coming up underneath you and someone coming up underneath them. And, you know, always, 
always keep that cycle going. You know, it's so easy to just get in there and I'm the one and I'm the teacher and, you know, I help all these students. It's so important that there's somebody there to back you up. You know, mm -hmm. some days I'm going to get sick. I have to know that there's someone else that can do my job. I want to be replaceable. I want to know mm. that if, if something happens, me, <laughs> me and my business partner, we always talk about, okay, if I get hit by a bus, this is what's going to happen. You know, like I want to make sure that if something happened, that all of this could keep going. It doesn't rely solely on me. You know, I can be one of the main puppeteers, but I want to know that if something happens, someone can take over and keep the train going. What do you look for when you're developing instructors? You talked about identifying people that you could bring up. It's really hard because uh, I've had a lot of people kind of surprise me and turn out to be really amazing instructors. So, you know, a lot of times I'll look for um, the fearless student in there that's not, that doesn't hesitate to, to lend a hand or give advice or help out or call counts or step up to the plate. You know, there's those real, um, extroverted types that are just kind of obvious, like you need to be a teacher. Um, but I've also had like some super shy kids totally surprise the heck out of me and turn out to be amazing instructors as well. So I kind of look for the whole gambit. I mostly just want someone um, who wants to be a teacher. If you want to be a teacher, I can make you a teacher. You know, I don't care if you're shy, if we're extroverted, you know, Whatever the case may be, if if you really have that desire, I'll make it happen because it's the best job in the world. This question might stir the pot a little bit, but we can stir <laughs> it together. Yeah. So you're not just looking at rank. No. You don't just say, oh, you're the highest rank, <laughs> so you have to be my next teacher. Can I tell you something ridiculous? Please. I've got some of the best five-year-olds that help me lead my classroom. It's crazy. They, <laughs> they have less fear than some of the teenagers that I'm trying to bring up right now. You know, they, they hop over and help each other with their belts. They call the commands. They show them how to do techniques. It's, it's unbelievable. So no rank. Obviously I want them to know what they're doing. I'm not going to put someone in front of a classroom that doesn't know the material. That doesn't make sense, but no, it's, uh, it's more, it's more personality and character than it does rank. I know a lot of really, really great high-ranking people that can't teach a class. Now, when I asked the question, you chuckled, right? So you, you know, you know, the common perception in our world that, you know, why you would never have someone that is a first degree black belt teaching someone who's a third degree black belt in an authoritative way that is frowned upon in many environments. I don't know that I'll say most anymore, but it's at least many, if not more than that. Did you get any pushback as you started to do that? Or do you get pushback from people? Well, I'm higher rank than them. Why don't you make me your assistant teacher? Not really, not too much. You know, it's the way that I kind of present it. I, I definitely don't have, I definitely ha don't have too many younger rank teaching the older rank, but I, I also wouldn't have any problem in a class, you know, if we got black belts together. You know, hey, uh, you're a first degree, you lead this form today. You know, we just, we're just very much a culture of like, we all have something to learn from each other. Mm. And yeah. let's be honest, like when my hips don't work as good anymore, you know, it doesn't matter what, what black belt I have, I'm going to need the second degree or the third degree to show that technique because they can actually still do it well. You know, my body's not going to work as good as it does right now. You know, I'm, I'm going to need that. Mm. And it, what I'm also reading between the lines is it sounds like you have a culture of teaching how to teach from a very young age rank. And so yeah. everyone understands the importance of that. Yeah. Did you do st similar stuff back when you were a school teacher? I don't know if it ever correlated back to being a school teacher necessarily having like other students kind of help each mm -hmm. other. Not, not too much, not too much. Okay. So what are you working on now? I'm working on, <laughs> yeah, my next big thing right now is building our teacher. It's funny you ask about teachers. We're building mm -hmm. our, our teacher base. We need, we need more teachers. We, um, you know, originally I wanted to build the school so that it could sustain itself. And we did a really great job of that. We went from a hundred students up to about 
few hundred students, um, maybe in a year or so. And then we doubled the size of our facility. That was in 2019. Hmm. And then COVID hit. So we were back to like a hundred, <laughs> kind of back to square one with double expenses. And then we got out of COVID. We're, we're at a solid like 250 students right now. So that's okay. sustainable. And that is amazing. I can't even believe it. that comes out of my mouth. It's so incredible. But now it's about building the teacher team, making sure that um, we can keep it going, making sure that uh, one of us can get sick without utter disaster. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no dial a sensei substitute line. So it's always mass chaos when one of the kids gets us sick. So uh, yeah, I just, I want to build my teacher team. I want to have a real solid team here so that we know everything is covered all the time and, and we can continue to keep growing and, and just keep doing all. I like to do a lot of things. I like to stay very busy. So mm. I want to have a big team so that we can all share it without getting burnt out. You mentioned hiring someone recently. Yeah. Was that a hire from inside the school? No. Okay. Now, I don't, know if you, country, I, I, don't, I don't know if you... I know you, you you pay attention to the show. I don't know if you caught the episode Andrew and I did talking about the pros and cons of hiring from within versus hiring externally, but maybe you can talk a little bit about that decision process. Because again, that, you know, you think about curriculum, well, we got to give them that. I don't have as much time with them. You know, do they just kind of interview resume well, or is this going to be a good fit, right? So and, and I think I heard you say across the country. Across the country. <laughs> okay, so, so talk about that whole thing. It's crazy. It's totally crazy. I can't believe it worked out. It's a perfect fit. I just feel like we won the lottery or something. I don't know. But um, we were looking for another instructor and uh, our student base is too young mm -hmm. to get somebody with what we needed. They were too young and too experienced. It was, it, we're, we're kind of behind since COVID on teacher training. So sure. there was no one from within that would have filled the role. So we had to look out into the world and we don't know what we're doing right so we put it out on indeed and we got an app we've got quite a few applications and um one of them was from a gal she is in she was in california the navy was transferring her out here and she was looking for a gig and it came together she she we knew she was going to be working on different curriculum but again like i told you i told her you know if you're open-minded you have a black belt, you have enough experience to stay a few steps ahead of the students, learn the curriculum, catch up, fill the gaps. And, uh, you know, mostly she was just a good, a good culture fit. Her, her personality and her work ethic really fit. Um, so filling in the martial arts was, was, was the easy part, I think. Mm -hmm. You said something that I, I think people who have, don't have a strong understanding of what um, public school education looks like may have missed stay one step ahead. Yeah. The idea that you step into an environment where you might be teaching, you know, if you were a math teacher, you might be teaching algebra and algebra two and geometry and pre-calc and maybe even additional classes. You might have five, six different curriculums that you know or, or are expected to teach through an academic year. And that's a lot of material, especially when you're getting down into the details so you can teach them. But yet in martial arts, well, you need to know all of these things. Well, sometimes we forget that form. Sometimes we miss that detail. Where, do, where does the where does the kiai go in that kata, right? And if you if you have the right materials, right? Like you can, okay, so here's the lesson plan, right? It goes back to the planning that, oh my God, you, you have a lesson plan, which not all of us do when we teach. It gives you that opportunity to say, okay, uh, tomorrow's rundown. Oh, how do I do this again? Yeah. And make sure you show up a step ahead. Yeah. It happened for me. I went from my original school way back in the day when I was a child. And then I moved to uh, a friend of mine's school. It was the same thing. He, we, I kind of grew up in more Korean martial arts. Mm -hmm. He did all Japanese stuff. Um, the terminology was different. You know, the way you cross your arms was different. Uh, but I kind of learned, no, it's, it's kind of all the same. There's some minor differences. So mm -hmm. when I was trying to learn his curriculum to teach at his school, that that's always what he told me you know I'm like I, I would always tell him I'm not ready I'm not ready and be like Kira you just got to be a couple steps ahead you know these students are 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 inexperienced they're new you have a ton of experience a ton of knowledge you just got to be a couple steps ahead you don't have to be perfect 
they're they're not going to know. You can mess yeah. up as, as really much don't. as you want. They're really not going to know. Um, ITF, did you have to deal with sine wave? No, uh, no. That that's that's the one. That's the element that I see people have the hardest time with if they come from ITF. They have sine wave, okay. and then they step into something else. So, because you've had a chance to work with a lot of different people, you've trained at different schools, and, and we now know you've trained in different styles. I would imagine that your views on martial arts and and material and curriculum, a lot of that, you know, that whole umbrella has probably changed over time too. You know, if if now Kira talked to younger Kira and compared notes, there'd be quite a few differences. Can you speak to any of the high points in in what we'd find? Yeah, absolutely. As far as my, you know, my views on martial arts, uh, it goes with kind of Asian experience too. When I was younger, this is the way to do it. This is the only way to do it. This is the way I was taught. Everything else is stupid, <laughs> you know? Um, and again, just because your view of the world is so small and you don't know anything else. So it's easy just to cling to what you know, and that this is the only way it should be done. And then I was lucky um, to, to kind of be exposed to a lot of different martial arts and get myself utterly confused with all the different ways to do the same thing. But also, um, it, it made me realize that, you know, a kick is my friend used to tell me a kick is a kick and a punch is a punch. You know, if it works, then you did it right. <laughs> and that's kind of how I view martial arts, you know, and, and I know some people are very, very much regimented in their style and they want to keep it traditional and they want to do that. I'm just, it's just, it's not what I was brought up with and it's not how I've evolved, mm -hmm. you know, as a martial artist, I'm not an Olympian, you know, I'm not a world champion. I don't have gold medals, um, but I've trained a long time and I know a lot of different stuff and um, I have a lot, a lot to give back and to teach and just I have an opportunity to keep training and do all sorts of different things, mm -hmm. which is unbelievable. And I get to do it all day long. So my, my view of the martial arts is just, yeah, kick and punch and do all those things as much as you possibly can. There's nothing's really right or wrong. So has your curriculum evolved? Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We is have it still evolving. You, you, you always, know? always, okay. always. Okay. I think your curriculum should always evolve. We always look at stuff and, you know, the way my curriculum was put together by my instructor originally, you know, you look back at that and you're like, God, why did I teach that at white belt? Why did I teach that to beginners? That's so difficult. You know, why were they teaching roundhouses to seven-year-olds with two weeks experience? You know, that's so difficult. Why was I doing that? Or why was I trying to cram so many basics down at the beginning, you know, when I can spread them mm -hmm. up, just things like building that curriculum. But every year we go through our curriculum and, you know, the instructors sit down and does this work? Does that work? Is it in the right spot? Uh, does it make sense? And yeah, we've, mm -hmm. we've changed our curriculum a lot. Our curriculum is super unique. I mean, I can't even tell people like what style we are because we're kind of our own entity. It's just an accumulation of all the different kind of arts that I've learned and how I feel like they go together. Yeah. I had a conversation over the weekend with someone talking about this challenge that they were having teaching rear leg sidekick to a child. I was like, well, yeah. let's, let's break that down. Let's talk about all the things you're asking a kid who struggles to stand up to be able to do that are, yeah. and some of them being completely non-intuitive. hundred percent. I learned, um, one of my friends was a physical therapist. You know, I asked mm -hmm. him like, I got to teach these little kids. My teacher talked me into teaching these little kids. What am I going to do with them? And he, he even said, you know, the, one of the most difficult things for the, the younger kids before the preschool age is to stand on one leg. And I'm like, why am I teaching them so many kicks then? <laughs> so now I do activities where they can practice standing on one leg. And uh, my favorite, we do a, we do a game talk called toe ninjas and they grab hands and they get mm -hmm. little, they get little ninjas on the floor and they got to pick them up and put them in the basket with their toes. It's Brilliant. so silly. It's a crowd pleaser here at Lake Zurich family martial arts. But again, yeah. What, what are, what's our expectations on the, on the students? You know, are they, are they failing because our expectations are wrong or, you know, what, what is it? One of the things that is changing in our world. And, and again, this is where I suspect your background in education, you didn't have to go through this, but the realization that children are not small adults. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> their brains are still developing. Heads up, everybody, until 25. Brains are still developing until 25. So when you look at a kid that's seven or eight and they were able to do it last week and they can't do it this week, it could be that when they can't figure out their left from their right, it's not because they're dumb. It's not because you're a bad teacher. It's because they just, things are just still plugging in. They're missing oh, absolutely. pieces. So I, I, I like that game. What what else what else do you do? I, I throw out a couple other things like that that people, I, I bet there's somebody out there taking more than one person taking notes. Okay, what else, what else do I do? I do? What else can I steal? Yeah, no, good question. I think one of the big things we would do in our classroom is um, like changing phases quickly. Um, we all know that the younger kids have different attention spans than the older students. And uh, we work really hard in like changing, changing states, I think is what they used to call it in my education background. I don't know, but, you know, changing activities every certain chunk of time. So mm -hmm. it used to be a rule of thumb for however old your students are. That's how many minutes you should be, you should be like changing up mm -hmm. what you're doing. That's so, a good guideline. You know, I teach a lot of five-year-olds. All of our stuff is kind of chunked into five minute pieces you mm -hmm. know so we'll do a, a warm-up will be about five minutes mm -hmm. you know we'll do a quick review of some things that they know it's about five minutes we have a mat chat it's about five minutes and and that that keeps their brain active and it keeps them focused and it kind of minimizes that oh god they're all tuned out and nothing's getting through anymore because you've been doing the same kick for 15 minutes you know so that's that's definitely a, a good piece if I could give any tip there is to look at, look at your lessons and are you switching things up? Mm. Again, rule of thumb for however many minutes your students are old. So, you know, your, your teenager class, like, yeah, you can go for about 15 minutes doing one thing. They're good, but then they're going to start kind of checking out. Yeah, it's, it's a good tip. And, and I'm going to guess that it's not always 10 on each side. Right. <laughs> right. That's, that's, that's one that is so instilled that I, I, um, if you really, here, here's a fun one for all of you out there. If you really want to mess with the people in your class, it's an adult class and it's a really traditional class, do eight and then switch sides and watch their brains explode. <laughs> and the fact that that happens is exactly why it needs to get mixed up. Yeah. What, what, one of mine, if I'm teaching kids and I, I don't quite know what I want to switch to yet, I'll just have them change direction. All right, everybody turn. We're going to do the same thing facing this way. Absolutely. And it's like hitting the reset button gets you another minute uh -huh. or two at least. Yep. No, that's, that's a good trick too. Just changing direction. We, uh, we never line up the same way in my class. Like Ooh, before class, that. We never, we never line up the same way. There's no real front of my classroom necessarily. Cause I want it to be different. I want, mm. let's be real. Students have to do things. A lot of times they have to be, they have to do repetition. You have mm -hmm. to, you know, um, but repetition is boring. So mm -hmm. how do I hide that repetition? And that's, that's one of the ways is every warm up. We might do the exact same warm up, but today it might be in a circle. Tomorrow it might be in lines. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, after every exercise we do, we might face the windows and then the back walls. Again, just just a way to mix it up. You can do the same thing over and over, and it just looks different, and it feels different for the students. And that's how you hide that repetition. So they get the repetition, they get what they need, but you hide it, like putting a sp like putting spinach in a smoothie, right? You know, I got to put it in there and I got to hide it. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great example. Yeah. yeah. Just Where's the one. spinach? Where's the spinach? <laughs> I like that. Um, how do you balance your own passion for training and development, right? It's very clear that teaching is your probably primary passion, but I suspect you haven't given up on the passion for developing yourself as a martial artist. How do you balance the two? It's really hard. <laughs> yeah. It's really That's why I asked not the question. Easy. It's really not easy at all. Um, it's it's always it's always me fighting with myself um, because it's a whole lot easier to put my time and my energy into running the studio mm -hmm. rather than getting my own training. And that is really, really hard. It seems like there's always something that comes up and I will sacrifice my own training, my own workout. Um to do what needs to be done for the studio. Whatever circus happens for the day, 
I, I seem to always make that choice. And that's, that's really difficult. I definitely don't have much work-life balance either. Mm. Like this is, this is it. This is what I do. Um, but as far as my own training, there's been a couple tricks. Um, I like to do our fitness class, which is like martial arts based fitness class. We hit bags, we lift, uh, kettlebells, things like that, cool. body weight exercises and stuff. And that's a way for us to get, um, kind of our adults interested in martial arts too. I feel mm -hmm. like I get a free workout as well. I get my own training when I teach that class. So that's a little way I've got some trickeration to doing my own training. Um, we have black belt workouts every Wednesday. It's non-negotiable. Mm -hmm. You have to be there. It's hard because it's the end of the night after you've been working all day and teaching all day, but non-negotiable Wednesday nights. Speak to that non-negotiable. What does that mean? You have to be there. You know, everybody, every, if you have a black belt in your school, yeah. What happens if you yeah, miss it? Especially the teachers. Well, you can get sick, you know, but it's not negotiable. Like mm -hmm. you're, you're going to be there and this is your class. If you're going to be, if you're going to be a teacher, you have to do your training yourself. You, you can't, um, you have to practice what you preach. So it's, it's not negotiable. Sundays at first Sunday of every month, we get a, together with a bunch of black belts, even from around the area. And we do our training. That's also non-negotiable. If you're a teacher, if you're a black belt, you're there. You have to get that. You have to mm -hmm. get that, that training. So we get those. I send myself on seminars when I can get away from the studio, when I can dial a sensei substitute, right, we'll do right. that. But yeah, it's, it's really, really hard, but it, it almost has to be forced. I have to force myself. I have to put in the calendar. I have to make it happen. Is it, is it one of those things that once you start getting going, it's okay? You know, or, or do you, is that, vo is there a voice in the back of your head through your training saying, oh, you know, I've got, I've got to go, I've got to run that report. I've got a payroll. I've got to do these other things. Or does the voice quiet down five minutes in? Never quiets down. Never quiets down. <laughs> it never quiets down so much that I've even, I've gotten a gym membership, um, a little bit closer to my house, which is so stupid because I literally own a gym, <laughs> but when I'm here, it's, it's hard for me to tune that out. So. I do a couple hours a week in someone else's gym. Mm -hmm. no, someone not else stupid tells at all. Yeah, I, I literally <laughs> recently rented an office. I mean, I'm, I'm home. I'm in the home office. I remember you I, saying that. And I thought the same thing. <laughs> and it's, it is on one, on one hand, it's ridiculous. I'm spending money every month that I don't have to do. But on the other hand, I look at my, my output. I look at the productivity and it, so I've, I've had this observation that I've shared with people. For years, it is difficult, almost impossible for two people to maintain multiple distinct relationships, right? And I'm sure you've you've seen that in the martial arts. It's hard for spouses to have one that's an instructor and one that's subordinate. It's different in different school cultures, but you know, plenty of people out there are probably nodding along, going, "Oh yeah, I saw what happened when so and so got promoted over so and so, and then they got divorced." Right? You know, it, it can it can be a mess. Or parents and children, right? It can be difficult. You know, the, the yeah. child being higher ranked than the parent. And, all kinds of stuff there. But it's also, you can say the same thing about spaces. Now that I don't do nearly as much work here, I mean, it's really, it's just, it's just the podcast because it's quiet. This is home now. Yeah. Your gym is work. Yeah. It's passionate, fun work that you love dearly, but it's still work and it's hard to make it something else. So you go to somebody else's gym where you don't have to care if the trash hasn't been emptied. Yeah. <laughs> I do wipe the sink though there. I always wipe the sink. <laughs> it's so neurotic. <laughs> You're just helping out. It's okay. Well, it's kind. so neurotic. But I'm yeah, sure I'm they just... appreciate it. <laughs> hmm. So what else? What should I ask you about you? Gosh, I don't even know. Pretty straightforward, pretty boring. Yeah. Yeah. Well, boring. I wouldn't I wouldn't use the word boring, but you 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 do come across rather straightforward. You yeah. like what you like. You're open about it. There wasn't I don't feel like I have to dig. I don't feel like yeah. there's much I could dig. I don't know what I'm gonna get though. <laughs> much there. Yeah, it's cool. It's an interesting story. I think uh, you know, if there's anything I could pass on is, you know, don't mm. let anybody don't let anybody tell you what you do and what you love to do can't be what you do for a living 
you know, I feel like, I feel like I lost, I feel like I lost some years there. I wouldn't give them up. They've, those 10 years in teaching helped me tremendously um, with what I'm doing now, but I let, I let someone convince me that I couldn't do it straight out the gate, you know? So looking back, it's kind of like, man, I could have used those 10 years a little differently. I could have kind of had a, a different head start. I wouldn't change it. I love how things worked out, but uh, I did let someone convince me that it, it wasn't an option. Well, and that well, was, that was here, silly. Here's a question then. If you hadn't, let's, and, and let's, let's be dramatic about it. You didn't go to college. You didn't get a degree in education. You didn't have that experience teaching in schools. Would you be as good of an instructor? Oh, 100% no. No, it would be, it would have been a totally different path for sure. Like I'm happy. Yeah. Everything that I've done makes me appreciate where I'm at. But it's, it is a little hard to swallow sometimes looking back and like, why did I let someone convince me of that? Why did I let I'm pretty stubborn in general. Tell me I can't do something. I'll do it. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> I just, I think it, looking back at it, it's a tough nut to, it's a tough pill to swallow that. Um, did, they, did they convince you or did you on some level agree? I, well, it was my limited experience. It was yeah. my limited experience. In my, stu in my studio, you know, nobody, nobody was a full-timer. Mm -hmm. Nobody, nobody had the business wherewithal. Nobody had the guts necessarily to really go out and do it on their own. So my limited experience, that's all I saw. That's all I knew. I was young. It's all I saw. It's all I knew. So it must be true. So yeah, I, I, I kind of allowed myself to be convinced, you know, that that was it, but I also didn't know any better. So, you know, there's that, but in hindsight, don't let, you know, in general, don't let anybody convince you you can't do something that you actually want to do. You know, that's, that's very limiting. And, you know, looking back at it, you know, I, I wouldn't want to be limited by that. What is, what is continued professional growth look like for you? Additional locations? No. More people? No. Okay. Oh, oh, that was emphatic. No. I, I don't think that I ever get that. very emphatic. Yeah. I know, I know that that's like kind of like the natural thing to do. Like you have a successful yeah. market work school, scale it. I have a friend that's in the insurance. <clears throat> excuse me, in the insurance business. And he says the same thing to me, you know, he's like, scale it, scale it, multiple locations. And I'm like, no, no way, no way. It's, it's really hard to maintain. We have a huge space too. We have a lot of, mm -hmm. we have one school that could be three schools. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm happier having one big circus than a bunch of little ones that I have to move around to. You know, if a student of mine wanted to open up their own program and I could support that, that would be cool. But I'm nowhere near that. I, I like my one big circus so I can focus on it and do a good job. I like the use of the word circus. It Very is. Apt. Very apt. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So last question before I kind of kick it to you to close up. Let's say we, we get together. We do this again in 10 years. What would you hope when I said, hey, Kara, what's happened in the last 10 years? What would you hope you were telling me? I hope that this school is running itself. I hope that I've done a good job creating a bunch of great martial artists. We've trained a lot of teachers and it, it could run without me. I'm still going to be here bugging everybody and teaching and doing whatever I want, but it would be really cool to know that it could, it could, it could work without me being here. Awesome. If people want to find you online, website, social media, anything like that, where do they go? <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, well, I need a drink. Yeah, it's okay. My huge water bottle. That's a very large jug of water. What? What? What are the stickers? Was that a like a colorful skull? Is that what I saw on the bottom? It's Cobra Kai. Oh, it's all Cobra Kai stickers. Okay, I saw it quickly. You're in my gym. Okay. And more Cobra Kai. That's what the cool oh, kids right. do. Right? They put stickers on their bottles. They do. I thought so. They um. Do. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Lake Zurich Family Martial Arts. We're in Lake Zurich, Illinois little uh, northwestern suburb of Chicago. Um, I'm all over Facebook. Lake Zurich Family Martial Arts is all over Facebook. Um, the teenagers in the studio helped me with Instagram. We're on Instagram, LZFMA. Um, me, myself, I'm on Facebook way too much, Kira Radke. And uh, website, LZFMA.com. Awesome. We'll have all that in the show notes. Yay.
how do you want to close? You know the show, you know what we do. What do you want to offer up as your last words to the audience? Goodness, I think um, I think what I would like to chalk up to everybody is um, martial arts is just such an incredible thing that you can do. It can be a hobby in your life. It can be your full-time career, but it's absolutely something that you can do your entire life. The people that have really inspired me in martial arts are the ones that kind of proved to me that it can be, <clears throat> it can be as much as your life as you want it to be. And you can do it at any age, any ability level. Um, it's something that can positively contribute to you as a human, no matter what age you are. You know, a lot of people think that I can't, I can't start martial arts. I'm not in good shape or I'm too old or I'm too, my, my kiddo is too young. He doesn't know how to pay attention. Like this is, this is exactly where everybody needs to be if they want to be. See what I'm talking about? How could that path for Kira have gone any other way? She could have chosen other things, I'm sure, but I, I have a hard time believing she would have remained there. there. There's something in this path for her that just the way it came through, I suspect the people who work with her and her students would agree with what I'm saying. Destiny is probably the best way to put it. Thank you for Kira. Thank you, Kira, for coming on the show. Thank you, audience, for checking out this episode. Thank you, Kataro for your sponsorship, your trust in us. Audience, help us, help them and help them help us. Kataro.com, K-A-T-A-A-R-O.com. Use the code WK10, capital letters, to save 10% on your first order. You guys are gonna be hooked on their, their stuff. They do more than belts. Check them out. Check out all the good stuff that they've got over there. And check out all the good stuff we have at whistlekick.com. Use the code podcast on five to save 15%. Whistlekick martial arts radio.com for all the stuff that we have related to this show. Don't forget, we can help grow your school, and I am available for seminars. Just reach out to me, Jeremy at whistlekick.com. Our social media is at whistlekick. Until next time, train hard, smile, have a great day.